Well, tonight we're celebrating the genius of Rube Goldberg. Uh, it's very hard to imagine in an era when we have reclusive cartoonists like Bill Watterson <laughs> that no one sees. We have reality stars that are basically famous for nothing. <laughs> um, that there was once a man, Rube Goldberg, who was as famous and as successful and as prolific as an American artist could be. In, uh, in the book, we estimate that there, during his 72-year remarkable career, that he produced over 50,000 original drawings and cartoons. In 1916, which is, um, you know, sort of in the early part of his career, he was making $50,000 from his newspaper cartoons and $50,000 from a contract to produce animated cartoons and other subsidiary sources of income. $100,000 in 1916 is over $2 million today. He was one of the highest paid cartoonists. He was friends with f famous celebrities. Charlie Chaplin was his friend. George Gershwin went to parties at his house. Groucho Marx and him were buddies. And he was just a really remarkable guy. And so tonight we're gonna try to cover all the facets of this amazing man, which is impossible. He did so much in his lifetime. You know, I wrote the biographical section in the book and just couldn't believe that, you know, not only uh, did he get trapped in Europe during World <coughs> War I, he survived the San Francisco earthquake, he, the Cold War, World War II. He was just seemed to be like everywhere at all times. So we've got some really great images that uh, Abrams has put together that are from the book that, that was published in November. And we're going to try to weave that through with some conversations and comments from our guests here. This is the cover of the book. If you don't already have it, I think there's copies here tonight. It's a really amazing book with a, with a moving cover. Now, Rube Goldberg has the unique distinction of actually having a dictionary definition of his name. I think that's what he's most famous for. Um, I'm not going to read that to you, but uh, I think we all know what it, what it is. He was also, this is a recent clip from Jeopardy. His name pops up all the time in game shows and crossword puzzles. Uh, but there's a lot of people that don't know much more about Rube Goldberg than that. Um, here, just to get a sense of the man, we're going to show you a little clip from uh, a movie, Artists and Models, who's that, who's that chap working over there? from 1937. Uh, Rube Goldberg. He's the original surrealist. Oh, I'd have to get over there, get a load of him, too. Well. Hello. Hello. Now, my name is Mac Brewster. Mine's Goldberg, Rube Goldberg. Oh, yes, I know your comic strip, uh, Lollapalooza. Thanks, old man. I'll do as much for you sometime. <laughs> Isn't she beautiful? I'll say. Oh, do you mind if I look over your shoulder? No, I'd love it. It annoys me terribly. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, uh, I don't want to appear critical, but uh, haven't you got her left arm just a little bit out of place? That's her foot. <laughs> oh, yes, that explains the shoe. <laughs> well, it's all finished now. What do you think of it? Uh, you mean to say this is her? <laughs> Yes, I saw her up there and brought her down here. Well, the trip certainly didn't do her any good. A good likeness, really. I'm, I'm proud of it. Hmm. Well, you mean to tell me that that's Art? No, no, that's Sam. That's Art with the beard. Oh, oh. And what connection has he with the model? That's her grandfather. I know him well. He's an eccentric old fellow, isn't he? He cuts his own beard. He's mad at the barber. Oh, well, I can understand that. Yeah, I don't blame him at all. And look, uh, this uh, bird cage over here. What's that? Uh, That's not a bird cage. Oh, yes, of course not. There's a bird in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mr. Brewster, I'd like to do your picture sometime. Well, that would be nice. You mean, well, if you did my picture, would I look like that? You look like that already. 
Say, I do, don't I? I do. Well, so long. So long. I, uh, you know, you and I must go out together sometime and have our heads examined. Oh, why bring them along? Oh, that's right. We'll have more fun alone. <laughs> uh, goodbye, Mr. Well, Rooster. Goodbye, Mr. Goldberg. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> funny guy. Um, so we're going to start talking at the beginning a little bit about, uh, with Jennifer, about growing up with this wonderful man as a grandfather. Um, of course, that's Rube on the left, uh, sort of late in life. Uh, but that uh, man with Rube in the right-hand photograph was Jennifer's father. father. Um, and, and this is right up front in the beginning of the book, uh, a book which took seven years in the making. Um, and that, that picture where he is with his uh, suspenders and his bow tie and his cigar is really how I remember my grandfather. So that I, I wanted that up front. And then, of course, the dedication, because my dad had started this project with Charlie Kochman and I finished it. So uh, I dedicated it to them. And who's that? <laughs> Uh, uh, believe it or not, I have hundreds of pictures of me with my other grandparents, my set of grandparents on my mother's side. This is the only picture I have with me with Rube. And I look totally miserable. <laughs> um, so uh, that's, that's it. And we would play croquet out at the beach. That was a little beach house in Ashroke Long Island, which is just uh, to the kind of, it's in Northport, actually. And that little house had been his studio, and they had a big house adjacent. They eventually sold the big house, made the little house a beach cottage, and my parents would leave me there for extended periods of time, uh, much to my chagrin, because I didn't like the beach, I hated the sun, I didn't like to swim, and so I was miserable. But um, it, what we ended up doing, and if you go to the next slide, we would, I'd play rounds of canasta all day long with my grandmother until she couldn't stand it anymore. And then um, Rube had to entertain me. So we would do things like puzzles and draw, and these were some of the drawings we did together. So he would draw an elephant, and then he'd hand me the pencil and say, okay, now you draw an elephant. And I would really try hard to copy him. So I think I did a, considering they weren't traced, I did a, an okay job. You got an A+. Plus. Yes, and what I always, I think it's so funny, he, he signed it to Jennifer Grandpa, and then he signed Rube Goldberg. Like, he knew it was going to, it was going to end up in a book someday, so. And, and you wrote a, a wonderful sort of remembrance piece in the book, um, and uh, what were some of Rube's favorite things? Uh, well, you know, the little kind of quirks that I remember, and remember, I was a child when I, knew my grandfather. He died when I was 11. Um, I remember him having the biggest ears I'd ever seen on a human <laughs> being. Um, he would wear shoes when swimming. He was always on time. He loved whipped cream. He could just eat bowls of it. And uh, when Cool Whip was, it came out, it was a new thing. He just thought that was the cat's meow and we had lots of it in the freezer. Um, what else do I talk about? He Cuban does. cigars. Oh, yeah, the cigars. And, um, you know, there's, it's funny. We'll get to some advertising pieces later on, but there's one great advertisement for Lucky Strike cigarettes. He never smoked cigarettes. And his shirt is open, he, and, or he was wearing a tie. He never went out without a bow tie, seriously, unless he was at the beach. Um, cool. That's great. I also thought it was interesting that, uh, that he drew with his left hand. He was pretty much ambidex ambidextrous. He could switch off. Yeah. Um, he was a lefty at a time when they would unteach you that. And so he could work with both. Right. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Rube is best remembered for. Um, Adam wrote a, a really eloquent piece in the book, um, sort of analyzing what Rube Goldberg's contraptions and machines really meant. And you talked about you can appreciate them on two basic levels. Um, would, would you like to talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. You know, it, one of the things that fascinates me about Goldberg <coughs> is that uh, he sort of existed in a couple of different worlds, his art did. And it became apparent to me when I first, uh, the first time I ever encountered his work actually was not, I was too young to see it in newspapers, it was actually at the Museum of Modern Art 
back in 1969, there was a very famous show called uh, the, uh, uh, the Machine, art at the, age of the, at the end of the age of uh, mechanical reproduction. And uh, they included a Goldberg along with all kinds of very esoteric modern art. And I was fascinated by that. So, and you heard in the Jack Benny movie, right, they call him the first surrealist. So there was a sense from the very beginning that he belonged in an odd way in a, in a world of avant-garde art. At the same time, when I, I got sort of on his trail a decade ago and I had a chance to meet Jennifer's father and so on, it was plain that just as you said, Brian, that he really belonged to the Gershwin circle in New York. He was part of an, an entertainment world, not part of an art world. And yet his art is always moving into that other world. And that's one of the things that fascinated me. The question is why? And I think it's because he's the great uh, poet of the mechanical. He loves machines, obviously, but it isn't just uh, any machine. He loves the kind of the first great generation of the machine. You know, if you look at patent drawings from uh, that same period or from a little bit earlier, they have the same look, A, B, C, D, E. They're all about things that work <laughs> by mechanical connections, right? You kick, in this case, I can't see this one here too, but you shake apples and it makes the midget jump up and then the flag goes over and the seal barks, and it's taking all of these animate things and mechanizing them and treating them as though they were purely uh, uh, automatons or robots. And so it's this way of making the whole world sort of into a robot. And that's at the same time, it's a very funny idea. It's a humorous idea, one of the kind of horrious chestnuts among people who try to philosophize about humor is to say that one of the ways the comedy works is you take the organic and make it mechanical. You take living things and treat them as though they're machines, famous uh, notion. And that's one of the things that makes it funny because he's doing that all the time. And at the same time, there is, I think at least for me, and you know, you never want to overthink something as, as charming and funny as Rube Goldberg's art, but there's an element of the, the sort of the, the scary or the satiric or the strange in his work that makes it fascinating. You want to look at it over and over and over again. You know, there's a, a equally well-known artist in England, Heath Robinson, who does very similar kinds of things. So if you're in Britain, uh, you don't say a Rube Goldberg contraption, you say a Heath Robinson uh, machine. So I got sort of interested. If you look at what Heath Robinson did, though, they're very much like, sort of like, children's fantasy drawings. They come very much... Softer. Much softer, exactly. They come very much out of that illustration tradition. There is, in everything Rube Goldberg draws, there's this kind of hard-edged American precisionist verve and uh, uh, toughness that makes the work sit on this fascinating line between wonderful comedy and something that just touches the edge of Morden's satire. And I think that's why we're drawn to him over and over, apart from his stature as an American cartoonist. Right. And, of course, documenting his career is a work in progress. Uh, when we started the, working on the book, I think the first invention was dated at 1916, but at some point in the process, uh, I think it was Paul Toomey came up with yet an earlier invention. And I've learned over the years in comics history never to say first or only. You know, it's, it, This is the first known invention that has been found so Especially far. because Rube didn't remember this one. I mean, yeah. the first cartoon he mm -hmm. he talked about was in a book that he wrote. So right. this is an earlier one. <laughs> Cartoonists are the worst at chronicling <laughs> their own history. Believe me, I know. They're the least reliable sources. No, there is, if I may say, jazz musicians are even worse. <laughs> if you ever have interviewed a jazz <laughs> musician. <laughs> They don't remember anything. They don't right? remember anything. Says yes, baby. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. This is a famous cartoon that he did uh, of how to, you know. The self-wiping napkin. Self-wiping napkin. Thank you. And it's kind of reminiscent of, in modern times, the feeding machine. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, there's, I kind of have a feeling, because they were friends, and Rube was in Hollywood during those years, that he might have had a little bit of influence on that feeding machine. The ultimate seal of approval. In 1995, the U.S. Postage Service issued comic strip stamps from the great icons of, of comic creation, and they used that same image on the postage stamp. This is another uh, device making things more complicated than they really need to be. 
He had all kinds of different newspaper features featuring the inventions over the years. Um, it, it's really difficult <coughs> to, you know, a lot of cartoonists, you know, Chester Gould started Dick Tracy on such and such a day in 1931 and he retired in 1979 or whatever it was. Rube Goldberg would drop a feature and start it again and pick it up and incorporate it into another one and he was just restlessly creative all the time. Uh, these are some more of his inventions. These are the late, that was a later one and this is a very early Beautiful one. Beautiful one, yeah. Right. I you think. Can tell by the hand. Um, these, this, these were inked in by an assistant or a stooge as they called them and then uh, the writing was slightly different. The, the, just the line, if you look at them carefully, and the, the, the faint one, as you see in the next image, that's a very early one where he right. did all of it. I think it's uh, widely accepted among sort of aficionados that the series he did for Collier's Magazine from the late 20s and the early 30s is some of his best work, and a lot of these are from that series. Think those are. So the Collier's ones were the Professor Butts ones, and Professor Butts was his alter ego. And what was great, Professor Butts would stumble into these <coughs> great ideas, whether he was, you know, falling down an elevator shaft and he thinks up, you know, a simple way to sharpen your ice skates or walking through a field of cactuses in his bare feet. He just, he was uh, clumsy at best. <laughs> right. can, can I ask you a question, Jennifer? I'd never thought to ask you before, he said, is, did he ever think himself sort of to be the captive of the machines? The machines were so famous, and yes. they were what everybody associated with them, and almost everybody hates their hit. You got it. Uh -huh. I mean, especially look about all the musicians out there, and they yeah. have to go show after show, and they have to play the song for the audience verbatim. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, every time he would go into a new chapter of his career, he would really kind of disavow the, what had come before it. Mm -hmm. And so when he got into editorial cartooning, he really thought, ah, I've, je suis arrivé. Right. And that was his moment. And then <coughs> he became a sculptor. Mm -hmm. He really thought his sculptures were the thing that were the best representation of his art. So, um, I mean, Al, maybe you can talk about that as a <coughs> you know, cartoonist and how you feel about your art moving forward. Well, in, in uh, going through the book and seeing, discovering a lot of things that I hadn't seen before, I realized that uh, uh, Rube was a man for all seasons. I mean, he, cre you know, most of us are proud of uh, hitting the jackpot just once, but he kept creating new features that became wildly popular uh, something uh, as simple as the buttons that said, I'm the guy who put the word fun and funnel, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff, which uh, may sound uh, trite today, but, uh, but people 60, 70 years ago didn't have uh, so much communication at their fingertips. That's right. And, uh, uh, they, they didn't hear uh, jokes all the time the way we do. Uh, we have a surfeit of it. But he just kept, it, it seems like he was creating a new feature every week. I mean, just the volume of work that he, he was extremely inventive, extremely creative. And uh, in a way, I sort of feel uh, even though I think he was just, you know, way, way above me, uh, I must have become a kindred spirit when I was very young because I, without even knowing his stuff, like that he was doing foolish questions in 1908, mm -hmm. uh, on my own, I, I did snappy answers to stupid questions. Uh, and the Foolish Questions, I think, ended in 1914, which was seven years before I was born. So uh, either I'm a plagiarist who can steal things before birth, <laughs> or, uh, or uh, 
there's something in the kindred mm -hmm. yeah. spirit part. Mm -hmm. And I also, uh, I love doing inventions for MAD. Uh, I, and I did a book called Al Javi's Mad Inventions. And they're not like rubes, but they're again the, the, the need to invent. And I, I can just feel what, what Rube must have felt, the need to, all right, be creative, but also to be inventive and uh, break out of the box. You know, lots of people created syndicated features and became very wealthy just doing like Little Orphan Annie mm -hmm. or The Gumps, day in, day out, from the time they sold the feature till they died. But Rube was, while he's doing Happy Hooligan, he's doing Lollapalooza, he's doing The Inventions, he's doing a million other things. It just seemed to be coming up with them every week. And that, I think, is remarkable. And in person, when I got to know him... Can you tell the story about it? Because the drawing is up here. Um, <clears throat> when you first met him, you were a student at the uh, High School of Music and Art. Oh, and yes. You, you I, went to interview him and show him some samples of your work in 1940. Right. I, I um, graduated Music and Art. Uh, into the depression, the Great Depression, its greatness is debatable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I seem to have established a rapport with various teachers at the High School of Music and Art for some reason or other, and uh, one of them told me that she can she asked me what I was going to do after I graduated, and I said, well, I would like to be a cartoonist. And she said, we, uh, my husband and I, know the Goldbergs socially, and if you'd like to meet him, perhaps he can help you get started. And uh, so I said, sure, and he, she arranged uh, for me to meet him, and uh, uh, this is in the book, so uh, I hate to kill this wonderful surprise. <laughs> they case, won't tell. <laughs> I went there to meet him, and he was, he was stern but gracious. I mean, uh, as I said before, he didn't suffer fools lightly, and I found that out later when he was president of the National Cartoonist Society. He ran a tight ship, uh, because people very often like to uh, hear themselves talk, as I'm doing right now. <laughs> and uh, they would pop up with uh, little speeches, and Rue would say, well, we'll take care of that later. But he said, all right, why do you want to be a cartoonist? And I fumped around a bit. And he said, all right, let me see your cartoons. And this is where uh, the disaster occurred. <laughs> I th I, cartooning was frowned on at the High School of Music and Art. It was fine art. So I brought my fine art, uh, pastels, uh, wood engravings, uh, you know, life drawings, etchings. And he said, where are the cartoons? <laughs> I said, well, we weren't allowed to do cartoons. I, I, I have them home, but I'm not... A, I didn't think you'd want to look at those things. And he said, well, uh, either you have to go someplace and, and study cartooning, or if you want to come back and bring some of your cartoons, I'll be happy to see you again. But right now I can't advise you because uh, I don't know where you can sell this kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was very nice, and I have a good memory of it. I'm sure he didn't have a good memory of it. <laughs> anyway, he was a gentleman. Well, um, idle. 
We got some. Uh, I'll just flip through these quickly. There's some early pictures. This was Rube's. Uh, this was his first drawing, and it is lost somewhere in my apartment. I have no idea where. It is. <laughs> if you were ever in my apartment, which some of you in this audience have been, you will understand why it's lost. Um, so we unfortunately had to put uh, a reproduction of it in the book. So. These and these are, were from his um, high school, Lowell High School in San Francisco, and. Uh, this was from uh, his uh, college yearbook. He went to UCAL Berkeley. And thanks to, I have to say, I mean, I, I talk about this a lot, that thanks to the internet, um, this book kind of came into being. Um, we have collectors all across the country, even in Switzerland, um, uh, who contributed to this book and who really made it complete. And, and you can't imagine, there's a, there are subsets of collectors all around the world, and you can connect to them, and they have gems and things that the family doesn't have. So uh, Paul Toomey is one. Carl Linich is with us tonight. He is another collector from Poughkeepsie who uh, made available so many wonderful cartoons that are in the book. Um, these are family photos. Rube lost his mother when he was quite young, and really, I never heard about her. I mean, I didn't even know her name until I started researching the book. Um, and so that picture over there, it's Garrett at the top. Uh, Max, who with the mustache, the father, head of the family, negotiated every single one of Rube's contracts, would take the train from San Francisco to New York, and he was the lawyer, businessman, head of the whole shebang. Then the, the next little guy over there on the left is Walter, Rube's younger brother. Then it's Rube, and then it's uh, Lillian. So <coughs> there they are. And there's Rube with Max. Rube loved Max. I think Max was kind of the reason he was so ambitious and so uh, determined to be successful, uh, considering Max wanted him to be a train engineer. He, that's where you made money, and that's what he was sent to school for, and uh, Max was in, he was the sheriff of San Francisco, that's his badge up there, um, and he had arranged for, uh, Rube's first job was with the sewer system of San Francisco, which lasted about two months, as you might imagine, <laughs> and um, Rube finally convinced Max, please, please let me be a cartoonist, so it was he, he had a little bit of time to try it out. So this is a cartoon called Father Was Right that appeared in Rube's um, kind of comic art throughout. And uh, he was always kind of nodding to Max that, you know, he, he, he should have always listened to him. His father's saying in the first panel, why don't you get a regular job, you know, <laughs> which is... Uh... <laughs> Instead of monkeying around with this, these foolish inventions. And poor father, he's so ignorant, he doesn't seem to know that Thomas Edison made millions out of the different things he invented. It seems like everything was about money. I mean, that was, like, if you could invent something, this was the dawn of, you know, the mechanical age in America. And everybody, everybody had an invention that, you know, somewhere that could make them rich. Just like today, we all have an app that we think could, you know, really get over. Anyway, this is um, Irma, my grandmother. And there they are on their wedding day in the center, their honeymoon to Havana, and how I remember them at the beach. This is the wedding cartoon. Um, this ran prior to uh, their marriage, October 17th, 1915, I think. Um, and it's the only one where there was a photograph in the cartoon itself. And it's interesting, later when he became uh, a sculptor, he would do his sculpting at the beach. He had a studio set up. And I would sneak in there periodically, and he would keep his works in progress under damp cloth. And uh, I would go in and sneak around and look at what he was making. And I'll never forget, I went up there one day, and I peeked under, and there was my grandmother staring back at me. And, and it was the spookiest thing. And uh, he actually never cast it, because he said he could never capture Irma the way he saw her. And trust me, it looked exactly like her. So um, it never got cast. I was probably one of the only people that ever saw it. 
This is an invention, how a simple way to fish an olive out of one of those long neck bottles. And this um, is in the book, it's lovely, but um, if you could read the fine print on the olive bottle, it says White Rose. And my grandmother's family uh, began White Rose food products, and you'll see their trucks all around the city. Some of you probably buy their toilet paper or whatever. They, they're still in business. <laughs> um, anyway, that was a nod to, to that. And this is Rube with his Minerva, uh, one of the first cars in New York City, um, circa 1910. And this is one of the famous party uh, pictures. So you can see um, there's, there's Rube. And do we have another circled one? That's um, Groucho. And that's George Gershwin. My grandmother would always say, oh, and the Gershwin boys would come and play. And, um, and they would basically, they'd take all the furniture out of their apartment, they'd line the walls with paper, and then their friends would kind of vandalize the place with their own form of graffiti. Where, where was the apartment, Jim? It was a house on West End Avenue, West, it's between West End and Riverside and 75th. I don't know the number, but it was right opposite the Schwab Mansion, which doesn't exist it's anymore. Too. Um, this is another section of the book that I love because it's very um, kind of girl-centric, and you don't think of Rube and kind of in the in the girl ladies department. Um, and so it was a, a a strip called the Weekly Meeting of the Tuesday Ladies Club, and I love the way he drew women and fashion, and it kind of went into uh, the world of the ladies, and it was sort of like girls at the turn of the century. Um, and it, same kind of issues, but uh, different prism. Another photograph of your grandmother with some of her friends dressed up? Well, they would do these crazy tea parties, and they weren't exactly drinking tea. And, um, and they, it, they're just wonderful. I mean, I couldn't, some of them have been lost to time, and I'm convinced that a family member destroyed them because he didn't want to be embarrassed by them. But there's one of my grandmother in blackface. There's another one of my grandmother dressed up as a woman kissing another woman. and I mean, dressed up as a man, sorry, uh, kissing a woman. But they, we couldn't find them for the book. Anyway, there they are. These are wearables. These are uh, inventions that you can kind of harness on your body, and I kind of, as a designer, I really like them. Um, and uh, there are many, many, many more than we could include in the book, but there's gonna be an enhanced ebook that's gonna have a lot more of this stuff in it. Now, you were talking about the long-winded speakers that he, could, he did not tolerate, so I found, we found a picture of, of Rube asleep on the dais where someone's talking. <laughs> then we found, uh, how to get rid of a long-winded after-dinner speaker. And then this one, which is one of my favorite strips, but we only had room for one of them, is uh, people who put you to sleep. And it's all different scenarios of people who put you to sleep. And uh, we've all been there. <laughs> and he was from an, an impatient man, temperamentally. Oh, terrible. And, and on time. Like, you know, and if you were late, you just, that was it. It was over. You weren't, he had none, none couldn't handle it. I think some of it, so much of his great humor from the 20s is observational humor right. about people having to deal with, you know, cars and other people and subways and, you know, all, all trains and, you know, just daily life, but how they were coping with it, you know. Brad, can I ask you a question? As a curator, as a scholar of the history of uh, uh, cartoons and comics, normally you think, as, as Al was saying a moment ago, <coughs> of the really successful cartoonists of that period as ones like Chester Gould, as someone who latched onto a subject, latched onto a strip, and were able to syndicate it right across the country. And one of the striking things in the book that I wasn't aware of is how many different mm. projects, how many different strips mm. he did. How was he able to make a living? What were the economics of doing so many different kinds of things and still being able to do so well with it? Well, I think he was always sought after. So mm. if he got tired of something, there'd be somebody else to Write right. a check. Uh, he was so prolific. I mean, he did uh, you know advertising, books, sheet music, shows. Uh, he, he did stand up on vaudeville for a while uh -huh. in the teens. He was in movies. I mean, later on in his life, of course, he, be, he was an editorial cartoonist and a political cartoonist. I think some of that probably is the reason why he isn't better known today, mm -hmm. because he isn't just 
you know, Harold Gray, Little Orphan Annie, Chester Gould, Dick Tracy. Mm. That's right. Just He's a, he was a jack of all trades. Right. And uh, I, I remember the stories that he would tell at our meetings. And uh, like one of them was that uh, one of the big publishers, where I don't know if it was Hearst or who was the, the big muckamuck in New York, um, uh, another big publisher. But anyway, he came to his father's place and said, look, I just got an offer of $25,000 a year to work for so-and-so, maybe the publisher of the world or something. <coughs> and his father said, no, forget about it. And uh, he was crestfallen, he said. He couldn't imagine turning down 25000 he found out the next day his father had called Hearst and got him 50000 Oh, I see. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's, he, he said the, the market for, uh, I mean, I think for, for us it's difficult to, to uh, get a fix on something like this because things have changed so much, but uh, you, you have to picture there is no television there are no soap operas on radio at that time. Uh, there are no storytellers except in someone well, coming to your house. house. Right. And, and the movies were, in, were silent pictures. Right, right. So uh, someone who could write dialogue and do funny continuities in, in the newspapers in full color, you know, was very uh, spectacular in that day. I mean, I was very impressed. When I, when I was a little kid, I couldn't get enough of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just read them and reread them, and then my brother Harry and I made books out of them because for some reason they all used to work in a grid. Like, you know, Little Orphan Annie was 12 boxes every Sunday. And I think Boob McNutt was the same thing. So it was easy to cut them up and make little, little books out of them, one panel at a time. And we had dozens of them that we made, spent a lot of time sewing. <laughs> you mentioned this, this earlier, The Foolish Questions was really his first big sort of breakthrough hit. Yeah. That this was just an idea that came to him one day and he did it and then people wrote in with their own ideas and they started submitting them and it just snowballed and it became, there were postcards and books and, and games and all kinds of products. And, and it, you know, it petered out after a few years and then he moved on to the next thing. But no, the, but you had from uh, 1908 to 1914, the, the uh, foolish questions was the rage. Right. And then after that he went, it, as a foreign correspondence cartoonist, to Europe and did kind of a takeoff on, uh, you know, uh, a, a tourist traveling around Europe and sending back cartoons about what fools the Europeans were, you know? <laughs> when he, he, I think he initially wanted to get a free trip to Europe. Right. And, uh, and then he got stuck there because World War I, you know, began. And then he luckily ha had um, a prescription in his wallet and he convinced somebody, some important person, that it was some official paper or document, and he talked his way back to the States when nobody was getting back on boats. Right. Well, um, maybe I'll flip through these quickly. I think we're getting a little short on time. Um, oh, we have some questions, okay. This is SAT. <laughs> I hope I can read. They changed the SAT now. So. My brother always jokingly says, we, we, we have block lettering in our genes, so it's hard for me to read, read other people's. What modern cartoonist would Rube have enjoyed today? Other than Al Jaffe. <laughs> <laughs> and he was enjoying Al Jaffe in 1940, so. Uh, let's see, who would he enjoy today? Not Gary Trudeau, because I, didn't, I don't think they saw eye to eye politically. I think he would have liked Gary Larson. Yeah, Gary Larson. I think you're right. Because Gary Larson had, a, had a, a science connection, I think. And 
And I think was, he would have loved all the homages to him. I mean, there's. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that what he would like have art, loved best. Like yeah. You know, I, I mentioned in the essay, because it picks up on something you were talking about before, Jennifer, and that is you're absolutely right that he was mocking the mechanical at a time when everybody was trying to make the next invention, where that's where you're fortunately, I think your, your comparison is very apt. It's like apps nowadays. Everybody's trying to invent a necessary app. But one of the things that's funny, and as I was thinking about it, is you know, one of my favorite contemporary cartoonists is uh, the guy who goes by the name of XKCD mm -hmm. online. Anybody ever follow his things? Wonderful kind of uh, stick figure scrawls about the computer age and about uh, information processing. But what's interesting about them is you can never see inside the machine. That's part of the humor of his, of his panels is, is that the, it, it's all about the computer, but you can't see inside the computer. And one of the things that makes uh, uh, Rube Goldberg so interesting and so much an artist of his time is that it's all about the chain reaction where you can see, no matter how absurd the contraption is, you can see every step along the way, the way the midget gets hot under the collar and inflames the parrot who speaks to the chipmunk who sets off the diver and so on. So part of the joy of them is that they're all plausible. There's never, mm -hmm. there's never a black box in a Rube Goldberg and you, you, you understand it, and as <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, today we are so far from understanding our own contraptions, our own contraptions exactly. that are so essential to our lives. Right. I mean, God forbid our iPhone doesn't work, but how the hell does it work? I, I don't know. That's why they call it the genius bar, right? Yeah. Because there you, have you to, go. <laughs> you have to do it. When you use the, the plausibly impossible. Mm -hmm. I, I heard that a, a while back, and I think it applies to Rube's inventions. Mm -hmm. right. They're plausibly impossible. Exactly. But, but he added the, excuse me, he added the, the extra ingredient which was really uh, um, making fun of, of everything, is that the end result was uh, trivial. <laughs> trivial. <laughs> necessary. Here's a good question for Adam. I think you addressed this in your essay. To what extent was Rube criticizing American culture for being too enamored of machinery, straying too far from the natural and the human, <coughs> and or becoming too dependent on machines? It's a good question, isn't it? I, I think, and, and Jennifer and Al can, can correct me, I don't think that he was a sort of biting, uh, Voltairean satirist who was indignant about the triumph of the machine. I think he saw it with a kind of affection and a sort of familiarity in the same way that we see computers and apps and so on. They're the material of our existence, so you have to pay attention to it. I think whatever his own intention was about it, I think they do sort of survive. They endure because there's so much about the futility of the mechanical, just as I was saying a moment ago. It's about incredible effort for minimal result. And I think that in that way, he was a wonderful satirist. He was, he, But I don't think that he ever had a kind of grim, uh, mordant, spirit of, yeah. uh, of uh, mean-spirited mockery. I, I think for Rube, it was all about, is it funny? Yeah. Yeah. At the bottom line, if it made you laugh, yeah. it was, he, he did his job, it was working. Right. Here's a question for you, Jennifer. Uh, hello, Jennifer. Was your grandfather always making crazy contraptions around the house, and did you ever get to help? The answer is no. And he apparently was not very handy, according to my grandmother. <laughs> I mean, changing a light bulb was an effort. But, um, you know, during those summers at the beach, th there, there had been these plastic models <coughs> of kits that you would put together. And there were four different versions. Um, and they, they were plastic models of the inventions. And so one, um, one weekend, we started putting one together. He was lost. <laughs> he could not put it together at all. So um, I think he was much better at drawing them and laughing. And you know, part of the the joy and humor of it also, he'll, he'll have an asthmatic flea. You know, like the idea that a flea has asthma <laughs> is wheezing into the yeah. yeah. That's part of the chain reaction, or you know, uh, an Arabian midget. Like it can't just be a midget; it has to be an Arabian yeah. midget. So he, it, they were just. He thought funny, and he drew funny. Um, this is a strange question. What's the relationship between Rube and Wallace and Gromit? I think you can talk a little bit here about how he still 
kind of a hot commodity in the contemporary society. Well, I think he would have, like I said, he would have loved it. He would have loved that people are, you know, that he had influenced um, Wallace and Gromit to that degree, I think. Um, he, you know, on the internet, uh, Rube Goldberg machines are, it's almost like a hashtag at this point. If you have a great Rube Goldberg machine and you post it on YouTube, just by using Rube Goldberg in that description will automatically get you thousands, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of hits. Um, it's, a, it's, it's powerful and it's, um, in and of itself, I believe there is a brand there. We are working hard to... Reclaim it. <laughs> reclaim it. <laughs> um, and there's uh, all kinds of exciting things um, in the future that at RubeGover.com you can learn about. But one of them is um, a theme park ride who does not want to take the Rube Goldberg roller coaster. Um, and I always say, sometimes I think I'm on it already. Uh, but um, there's TV, there's movies, there's, there's a ton of stuff in the offing. And I think because of the power of the name and the brand, and yes, he is known for one thing, pretty much. And even though we understand there's this breadth of uh, work that we're celebrating here tonight and in the book, um, he's an adjective. And that is, that's what brings us to the point where we talk about him <coughs> as a genius, I think. Um, I think, Adam, in your essay, talked a little bit about the ultimate device of the 20th century. Yes, this was one of, uh, of, of Rube's, if I may call him that, uh, most famous editorial cartoons. It won the, uh, the Pulitzer that year, did it not, yes, for, it did. for editorial cartooning. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's not at all what we think of as a Rube Goldberg. It's not, uh, it's not funny, it's, nor is it even stylistically. It doesn't have that sharp-edged, wonderful kind of Art Deco uh, black and white quality, but it's an unforgettable image of uh, a little ordinary house in an ordinary family balancing, uh, again, not unlike the cabin in Chaplin's uh, The Gold Rush, on the edge of nothingness, on the edge of, a, of, of an abyss, destruction. total destruction of the atomic bomb, the, the fat boy. And, I, and you can see it's world destruction on the one hand and world control of atomic energy on the other. And it was chilling for me when I came upon it, when I was thinking about what I was going to write, because, of course, this black object here is the ultimate chain reaction. That's the... What, the most famous chain reaction of the 20th century was Enrico Fermi's in a Chicago squash court when they realized, oh yes, you could do that. You could make a chain reaction where the midget kicked the, the diver and the diver kicked the asthmatic flea and the asthmatic flea kicked the atoms and the world blew up. Um, and that's, uh, it's an astonishing thing that, that at some level he uh, made this last unforgettable image of the, uh, the dystopian ends of mechanical chain reactions. Hmm. Somebody asked here, uh, is there a museum of cartoon art? And <laughs> I can answer that <laughs> uh, I used to work there, actually, um, when I first got out of college in 1974, and it moved around. And uh, long story, but it, the latest iteration of the Museum of Cartoon Art, it just opened at Columbus, Ohio. Ohio State University opened a state of the art institution called the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. It opened in November. And there was a Rube Goldberg invention device cartoon in the opening exhibit. And uh, next, uh, March 22nd, they're opening up the next big exhibit, which is a retrospective of Calvin and Hobbes and uh, Bill Watterson, and also Richard Thompson, who's a talented cartoonist that does cul-de-sac. And, and we should mention your father, I'm certain, is included right. in talking. Well, my father, Mort Walker, creator of Beetle Bailey, was the founder of the Museum of Cartoon Art. And uh, he's still very much alive and drawing and playing golf and making trouble at 90 Amazing. years old. Amazing. <laughs> and, um, and I work with him in the family business, cranking out, uh, we call them gags. Uh, for Beetle Bailey and High and Lois. And uh, I can remember going to National Cartoonist Society parties. They didn't take me to the Reuben, which was the big black tie thing, but they used to have sports nights. And I remember this big tall guy with a big long cigar who was always the master of ceremonies, and uh, that was Rube Goldberg. 
So I, I just also want to say when you when you win like the Oscar of cartooning, you win a Reuben, and it was named after my grandfather, and he designed the statuette. We do have some slides somewhere uh, in this copious amount of <laughs> slides that we have. Um, and uh, anyway, he was very upset at the end of his life that he had not won a Reuben. <laughs> Reuben had not won a Reuben. And so, and my father tried to explain to him, but Reuben, it's named after you. <laughs> but that did not do. And towards, I think, at the very end of his life, they presented him with his honorary Reuben Award, which uh, we have in my apartment where you can literally find nothing. But I know where that is. You know, uh, I was at the meeting when your grandfather brought the maquette. Oh, really? Of, 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 the, uh, of the Reuben, and it was unveiled. And he made a speech in which he said, uh, the Oscars are, <coughs> are given out to people with, uh, you know, some with dubious talent, where we have stars in our organization who get an annual piece of paper that says, you know, congratulations, you've got the most votes mm -hmm. for the uh, cartoonist of the year. So he said, uh, we need a, a statue of our own. And I, I did this maquette. And if you like it, uh, we'll have it. If not, forget about it. Well, and, there it is. Yep. And Bill Crawford did the uh, casting of it, and uh, it's been with us ever since. Amazing. Yeah. I heard he got the idea from a lamp. From a lamp? <laughs> of a lamp, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to uh, close with a final uh, announcement here. Uh, our friend here, Al Jaffe, will be celebrating his 93rd birthday on Thank Wednesday. You. I'd like to sing happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday oh to you. <laughs> happy birthday, dear Al. Happy birthday to you. Are you one? Or are you two? <laughs> Do you have? Oh. This will guarantee that I won't have another birth. <laughs> <laughs> Al, do you have a snappy answer to the stupid question when someone asks you, how old are you, Mr. Jaffe? Yeah. Right. No, I don't have a snappy answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, thank nope. you very much for coming thank tonight. You. And, uh, thank you. Thank you.